From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. And let me welcome you back if you are a returning listener. Perhaps this is your very first time. If it is, well, an especially warm welcome for you. For the next 30 minutes, we're going to be talking about cannabis. I hope you have some interest in that because that is a plant that I have an absolute passion for. And before we get too much further, let me remind you this program is intended only for those 19 or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment and perhaps educational purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. On episode 137, well, there was a new petition out that was created by a member of Parliament in Canada that is asking the government to increase the level of THC in edibles. We'll have that for you. Plus, did you know that the man who invented RSO or Rick Simpson oil, so Rick Simpson, is having some problems these days. He's a little down on his luck. We have a story on that. You may have heard the story of Snoop Dogg was given up smoking. Well, actually, Snoop Dogg gave up smoke. We'll have the explanation for you. This is appearing in so many products these days. CBG. Now, CBG is the mother of all cannabinoids. It's where everything starts. And we're going to have an explanation on that for you. There's a new movie out by Ridley Scott on the life of Napoleon. And apparently, Napoleon banned cannabis because his soldiers were getting too high. So we'll have a story on that as well. And on Cultivar Corner, we are going back to the Kootenays. This is from Kootenay Quantum Cannabis, and it is their crystal caviar. Mm-mm. All of that and more on episode 137 of the Cannabis Podcast. And as always, let me thank you for being a listener. I truly appreciate the fact that you are here. I also want to thank my supporters, Kevin and Jordana, at buymeacoffee.com slash Cannabis Podcast. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can go there too and buy me a doobie. I also want to thank my patrons at Patreon. And they are Tony and Roger, plus with ad-free episode access, Rob and Gage. I truly appreciate the support each and every month. Now, let's get to our first story. And for our next story, we are going to the ounce.ca. I guess it's actually our first story, isn't it? <laughs> Do you think I might have smoked a joint already? No, 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 wouldn't happen. Well, some profit from his name, Rick Simpson, is down on his luck. Known as RSO, Rick Simpson Oil is now widely available in Canada, where it originated. Ironically, while cannabis producers and scammers profit off both his recipe and name, Rick Simpson is struggling through a financial crisis after suffering a stroke in 2018 that left him paralyzed on the left side. The doctors didn't think that I was going to walk again, says Simpson in a video, but slowly I've been recovering. I hope in the near future to be back to normal again. Simpson's life changed years ago when a workplace accident left the former engineer from Nova Scotia with severe tinnitus. He used his oil to relieve his symptoms after running out of traditional options. Simpson eventually achieved global visibility as an activist for growing cannabis, producing oil, and making it available for free to those who needed it as a natural remedy. Simpson made the recipe for RSO accessible on his webpage in 2004, but he did not patent it. He traveled the world lecturing to raise awareness about cannabis and its healing properties. Simpson is currently living in Zagreb, Croatia. After years of advocating for people's rights to heal themselves using natural remedies, more specifically cannabis oil, today widely known as RSO Rick Simpson Oil, which a great number of people around the world are using to either cure or help regulate many different health conditions, says the family. Rick is now in need of some kindness from all of you who are willing and able to help. Simpson's wife, Daniela, is his sole caregiver. They're fundraising to help pay for his medical costs and are asking those who can help to buy one of Simpson's books or donate at simpsonramadur.com. Rick has come a long way in the last two and a half years, But despite all human efforts to meet and keep up with all of Rick's medical needs, Rick and Daniela are now facing immense financial challenges, says the family. Meanwhile, Simpson is also having to fight scammers, trying to profit off those who are vulnerable and facing health crises. Recently, he even had to respond to false reports of his death, which he says are greatly exaggerated, during a video message on the GoFundMe campaign. Most people know that my name has become very well-known worldwide, 
and there are people out there that think I'm a rich man. As you can see, that's not the case, says Simpson. At the present time, there are many people out there selling oil and using my name, or they're putting out oil and calling it RSO, but it's not RSO. I just want to warn the public that this is going on, so please be very careful. Don't waste your money. He says RSO is made from strains of strong indica and has nothing to do with CBD. The only two sites officially associated with Simpson are phoenixtears.ca and simpsonramadur.com. Too bad to hear that Rick Simpson is in dire straits. And if you can, maybe you can go and I you can see the GoFundMe campaign link when you click on the link to the story back at the page for the podcast. And by the way, I didn't credit David Wiley as the author of that story. From the cannabis-infused studio in the clouds, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And now let's talk about the very clever marketing that North America experienced over this last week or so. You may have heard the story that Snoop Dogg was quitting smoke. That's what he said. He was, said he was giving up smoke. And of course, the world erupted. Oh my God, what could happen if Snoop isn't smoking weed anymore? But he never said that. He said he's giving up smoke. Here's the story from 420intel.com. The rapper and entrepreneur's statement shocked fans Thursday after he posted a black-and-white social media post announcing, After much consideration and conversation with my family, I've decided to give up smoke. Please respect my privacy at this time. I'm giving up smoke, he added in the caption. Snoop did not clarify whether the smoke was related to cannabis or something else until now. The rapper announced Monday that he is partnering with Solo Stove, a smokeless fire pit brand. <laughs> As a sidebar, incredibly clever marketing and, and use of the media to, to spark interest in a story. Fabulous. End of sidebar. I love a good fire outside, but the smoke was too much. Solo Stove fixed fire and took out the smoke. They changed the game. And now I'm excited to spread the love and stay warm with my friends and family, Snoop said in a press release. Under his partnership, the business mogul is the official smokesman for the brand and will be releasing a collaboration on Monday at, let me think, what time now? Oh, 4.20 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time at solostove.com. A few users wondered whether Snoop was being serious. Define smoke, actor Lamorne Morris wrote under Snoop's Instagram post. Well, user at MB02 asked, is it April Fool's Day? In subsequent posts, Snoop referred to, but didn't clarify, his vow to quit smoking. A couple of hours after his initial post, he posted a selfie with the caption, Respect my privacy, followed by another selfie post the next day that simply included a gust of air emoji in the caption. In the slightly blurry photo, Snoop is looking off to the side. After Snoop's unexpected announcement on Thursday, many commenters, including Queen Latifah, showed their support for him in the comments. You got this, Unc. Venezuelan singer and rapper Micro TDH chimed in, not smoking is the new smoking. His announcement came just hours after his product launch with Martha Stewart of their Best Buds bags. According to Snoop's statement to Hip Hop Music Magazine, the source, the limited edition cross-body bag has got it all. From my favorite lighter, favorite color, and dime-sized secret stash pockets to stash my favorite herbs. The two also collaborated on a lighter collection that will debut next year. The gin and juice rapper's long made mentions of marijuana in his music and has several businesses in the cannabis industry. He has a branded line of weed, Leafs by Snoop, and he joined the cannabis investment fund Casa Verde. Snoop did not give up smoking weed. He just gave up having smoke around his fire pit. <laughs> Incredible piece of marketing. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Cultivar Corner, Cultivar Corner, oh yeah. Cultivar Corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're heading back to the Kootenays. This is a product from a company called Kootenay Quantum. And the product is Crystal Caviar. Mm -mm -mm. Now, we've been to the Kootenays before. We've been over there for Sweetgrass Cannabis. We've been there for Woody Nelson. Now we're coming back for Kootenay Quantum and their Crystal Caviar. 
They are one of the newer entries. Well, they've probably been around for a number of years, and I'm calling them new. <laughs> to the legal market, let's say. And what's happening over in Nelson is the Antidote is a processor that has created themselves in Nelson, uh, an association of the various micros, and that gives them an avenue to the legal market. And that's where Kootenai Quantum Crystal Caviar came from. Now, you can tell that they are new to the market uh, when we go looking for their presence on the web. And I could not find a specific website for Kootenai Quantum Cannabis, but I did find their sub-site, their sub-page on the Licensed Producers of Canada page. So Kootenai Quantum Cannabis, a micro-cultivator, a Canadian licensed producer of cannabis products, and they have a micro-cultivation license. They are focusing on areas of dried flower and fresh flower. I bought a 7 gram of the Quantum Kootenai Quantum Crystal Caviar, and I have to say I was pretty impressed. One single cola came out of this jar. I'm not quite sure how it fit in this jar, but it did. And it was one single cola, a massive cola, filling the jar, filling the jar with flavor and with aroma. So now I did find some description of Kootenai Quantum. I just got to go to a place here where I can get it. So I got some details from Canna Cabana on Kootenai Quantum. So this is a sativa, it's a cannabis flower rich in trichomes, which are the resin glands containing cannabinoids and terpenes that produce effects ranging from relaxing to stimulating, depending on the potency and ratios of each active compound. Effects can usually be felt immediately, last two to four hours, typically with a peak reach within 30 minutes to an hour. And I realize this is just a description of cannabis. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Kootenai Quantum. <laughs> Or crystal caviar, for that matter, which I'm a little disappointed in. <laughs> so, we're just going to have to go with what's on the label, I guess. Kootenai Quantum Crystal Caviar. So, here's the details. 26% is our total THC. My terpenes at 3.83%. And here's the terpenes that are inside this lovely little jar. 1.39% uh, limonene, 0.04% or 0.4% linalool. 0.46 of alpha cedrine, 0.41 of alpha pinene, and 0.39 of beta pinene. Notes are sour tangerine hops and banana. Definitely some sour tangerine in there. Oh, lots of those sour notes. It is very, very fruity. I'm not picking up the banana, but I don't tend to pick up those banana notes. I think that's just my <laughs> endocannabinoid system. By mm. But boy, is that ever a beautiful flower. So I got the joint rolled. I've got my Air Max all ready to go. Let's get that some heat on it so we can begin the process. All righty. I got power applied to my Air Max. That is slowly heating up. And while we're waiting for that, let's start the joint of Kootenai Quantum Crystal Caviar. Hmm. Looking forward to this one. Oh, nice and smooth on the joint. Yeah, definitely some sour notes. Mm -mm -mm. Loving those sour notes. And maybe a hint of that banana on the exhale of that. Not really too sure. Oh, but really nice and smooth. Quite enjoying that. And my Air Max is ready. So let's see what this tastes like through the vaporizer. Okay, there's a little bit of the fruity notes. Definitely that sour tangy coming through. Sour tangerine, I suppose, is what I'm supposed to say. Mmm, very nice. Oh, and here come, <laughs> and here come the effects. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Really nice start to my day. Let me put a roach clip on this guy so I don't burn my fingers as I continue to smoke that joint. So back to the Air Max. Hmm. Really like the taste through the vaporizer. 
definitely getting some of those sour tangy notes. A little bit of the hops, I suppose. And back to the joint. Mm -mm -mm. And here we go. <laughs> this is, as usual, my first smoke of the day. Lovely to get my day started in this manner. Especially with a really nice bright sativa. Wow, this is going right to my head. <laughs> there's the happy eyes. There's that, that headstone that those of us who like our sativas in the daytime really enjoy. So not foggy, not putting any barriers in front of me. <laughs> Just really sweet feeling. Oh, that feeling of getting high. <laughs> it is a lovely feeling, and we found it once more. So again, uh, the relatively new, so I don't have a lot of details on the web, but we won't hold that against them because there's opportunity for that to come later. This is a product from the Kootenays, uh, again, processed by Antidote, and Antidote's uh, line is Local Farms, Global Change. I love that idea. Kootenay Quantum, 26% total THC, 3.8% total terpenes. On a delicious sativa. Mmm. Jar appeal as soon as you open that. That big fat bud just jumps out at you. Well, actually, I had to take it out of the jar, but it would have jumped out at me, I'm sure. Mmm. Very well cured. Incredible potency. Incredible taste. <laughs> I really am a Kootenai boy. <laughs> and it's nice to be back home. Kootenai Quantum. Crystal Caviar. Another treat from the Kootenays. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. Hey, if you want to change something, start a petition. So, okay, one has been started. This was initiated, in fact, by Sarah Mills from Toronto, Ontario. And it was put forth by Member of Parliament Patrick Wheeler. West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, and Sea to Sky County. Or, sorry, West Vancouver, Sunshine Coast, Sea to Sky Country. He's from the Liberal Caucus of British Columbia. Whereas, the current limit of 10 mg THC serves as a suitable starting point for newcomers, however, fails to adequately cater to existing consumers, the legal, regulated cannabis industry is unable to compete against the illicit market and... THC limits are contributing to an entirely new stream of single-use plastics, contrary to this country's plan to address pollution and prevent plastic waste. We, the undersigned citizens of Canada, call upon the Government of Canada to increase the maximum THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, allowed in edible cannabis products to 100 mg. We believe that increasing the THC limit will address the above concerns, will benefit consumers, and will contribute to a more sustainable industry as a whole. Both the Canada Competition Bureau and the Ontario Cannabis Store have called upon Health Canada to increase THC limits. The Competition Bureau has stated that restricting THC levels may not be necessary to achieve the government's objectives, while the Ontario Cannabis Store has emphasized the need to revisit the current THC limits. These endorsements from reputable organizations highlight the importance of reconsidering the current restrictions. Therefore, we respectfully request that the Government of Canada urge Health Canada to increase the THC milligrams allowed in edible cannabis products to 100 milligrams. That is the petition. If you want to add your signature, I have included the link to the petition page on the show page for the Cannabis Podcast. You can go there and add your signature if you so desire. For our next story, we're going to hightimes.com for an explanation about CBG. Canna Beginners, Cannabigero, CBG, explained. Get to know this stem cell cannabinoid. Well, much of the focus on cannabis is on the well-known cannabinoids like THC, CBD, and CBN. There are over a hundred cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Cannabigero, CBG, is one of the lesser-known cannabinoids that has been getting increased attention in recent years for its unique properties and can now be commonly found in all types of cannabis products. Like many cannabis discoveries, the original discovery of CBG can be attributed to Dr. Raphael Mechelum and his colleague, Dr. Yehel Gayoni. While they were able to isolate CBG from some samples of hashish, the full importance of CBG in cannabis chemistry 
wouldn't be understood for another decade. Before he passed, Dr. Meshlom created multiple derivatives of CBG, which showed anti-inflammatory, pain-relieving, and obesity-preventing properties in rodents. In 1975, Yukihiro Shoyama led a team of researchers who were first to show the biosynthesis of cannabinoid acid, including how cannabigerolic acid, CBGA, is formed, and how it converts into other cannabinoids like CBG. For many years, it was believed that CBG was exclusively produced by cannabis, but recent research definitively confirmed it is also produced by the woolly umbrella plant, which produces the largest number of cannabinoids found anywhere other than cannabis. This discovery gives cannabis companies interested in CBG an additional source they can extract from. While much is still unknown about cannabis biochemistry, and we're constantly learning more, we do have a clearer picture of how CBG and other cannabinoids get made than in 1975. Though there are a few earlier steps in the conversion process, most sources online focus on olivatolic acid as the starting chemical. When olivatolic acid combines with geranol diphosphate, CBGA is formed, which then combines with various synthases to create CBG, THCA, CBDA, and CBCA, which further convert into THC, CBD, and CBC. This is why many researchers have referred to CBGA, and in some cases CBG, as the mother of all cannabinoids, or the stem cell cannabinoid. There is some mixed opinion on if CBG itself can convert into THC, CBD, and CBC, or if just CBGA. Some of the most current research on CBG contains a flowchart showing the biochemical pathways that can be taken. And on that chart, CBG is clearly a dead end. That seems to indicate that once CBGA becomes CBG, it will remain in a somewhat stable form, as stable as THC or CBD at least, which are both known to break down into other cannabinoids. A few years ago, I interviewed Seth Crawford, one of the founders of Oregon CBD, who told me about their CBG breeding efforts. We developed the first pure CBG Type 4 line, said Crawford, noting, I know GW developed those years back, but they are held proprietarily. We are a seed farm and sell seeds to farmers. For anyone not sure what he meant by a Type 4, that is a way to describe cannabis cultivars by their chemotype rather than indica or sativa. The first Type 4 chemotypes were identified in 1987, but it still has not seen widespread use, likely because so few plants exist. Our ratio is 100 to 1 CBG to THC, Crawford boasted, adding some individual varieties can go over 300 to 1. Since I spoke to Crawford, many other breeders have begun to breed for CBG, and there are several CBG-rich cultivars available. In 2008, GW Pharmaceuticals applied for and eventually received U.S. and EU patents on CBG in the manufacture of medications to treat diseases and conditions benefiting from concurrent agonism of the CB1 and the CB2 cannabinoid receptors. The now withdrawn or abandoned patents listed examples of those diseases including pain, neurodegenerative disease, ischemic disease, brain injury or damage, acquired brain injury, age-related inflammatory or autoimmune disease, nausea and vomiting, glaucoma, movement disorders, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, allergy, psoriasis, diabetes, cancer, and nephritis. Aside from GW's research, several studies over the past decade or so have substantiated CBG's benefits for a range of medical conditions in cats and rodents. We've known since 1984 that CBG has benefits to animals suffering from glaucoma, specifically cats, lowering intraocular pressure like THC without the feeling of being high. A 2009 study followed up on that research and showed CBG and THC had notable benefits to both cats and rats, including finding cannabigerol and related cannabinoids may have therapeutic potential for the treatment of glaucoma. Aside from glaucoma, CBG has also shown multiple mechanisms to treat the inflammation that leads to inflammatory bowel disease. Those anti-inflammatory effects are not limited to the bowels, and a 2012 study noted CBT and CBG also have analgesic and anti-inflammatory effects. Perhaps one of the most unique properties of CBG is that it has been shown to aid neuronal regeneration in recovery after spinal cord injuries. One potential downside could be nausea, where it has been suggested that interactions between moderate doses of CBG and CBD may oppose one another in the regulation of nausea and vomiting. So there you go. 
the next time you go into your dispensary and they're talking about some CBG in the product, you have a better sense of where that lies in the history of cannabinoids. And education is always good. From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. And while not directly related to the consumption of cannabis, here's a story from 420 Intel that's just kind of interesting from a cannabis perspective. In Ridley Scott's historical epic Napoleon, the titular French conqueror, played by Joaquin Phoenix, marches into the deserts of Egypt and orders his soldiers to aim their cannons at the pyramids. The whole scene is a fabrication. One Scott, who directed the equally sensational Gladiator, also starring Phoenix, has already been called out by historians. But even if Napoleon Bonaparte did damage these world wonders, this wouldn't have been the strangest thing to happen during his excursion into Asia Minor. The Imperial French army invaded Egypt in 1798, after capturing the Mediterranean port of Malta, with two purposes, to break up trade routes between India and England, and to establish French rule in the Middle East. Ultimately, Napoleon's biggest obstacle wasn't the Egyptians themselves, but their love of hashish, a love that spread to his own soldiers, and which he eventually resolved to ban, thus laying the foundation for Western Europe's approach to cannabis. Rather than forcing their own customs onto the Egyptians, Napoleon urged his administrators to embrace the local culture. French forces, including scholars and scientists, established libraries and research centers to nourish their genuine interest in the many traditions and inventions of the Islamic world. Lacking access to their French wines and liquors, they also learned about hashish, and soon began frequenting the cafes, markets, and lounges where the substance was typically found. Legend has it that Napoleon issued a ban on hashish because his soldiers were too stoned to fight. But this is as much of a misconception as Ridley's film. In truth, hash did not become illegal until after the campaign had come to an end. The ban itself wasn't implemented by Napoleon, but one of his generals and its goal wasn't to protect French citizens against the drug's corroding influence, but exert control over Egypt and Syria by pitting its own citizens against each other. As Ryan Stoa explains in his article A Brief Global History of the War on Cannabis, written for the MIT Press Reader, hashish in Egypt was associated with Sufi mystics and looked down upon by the Sunni elite. The general Napoleon left in charge of Egypt, Jacques-François Minot, saw the hashish ban as an opportunity to kill two birds with one stone. In addition to improving a perceived public health problem, the general, married to a Sunni elite, also hoped to earn the respect of his in-laws. Issued in 1800, Manu's mandate is often considered the first drug prohibition law of the modern world. It's one of the most uncompromising, prohibiting the cultivation, sale, and consumption of cannabis in one fell swoop. The Egyptians weren't allowed to smoke cannabis itself, nor were they allowed to mix it into their liquor. Those who were accustomed to drinking this liquor and smoking this seed, the mandate read, lose reason and fall into a violent delirium, which often leads them to commit excesses of all kinds. Bit of a sidebar here. Does this not seem reminiscent? <laughs> I'm thinking of reefer madness for some reason. End of sidebar. The ban, like many other idealistic goals pursued by Napoleon's administration, didn't work out. According to Stoa, hashish continued to be grown, traded, and used across Egypt, a practice that, if archaeological finds can be believed, dates back as far as 3000 BC. Not only did French soldiers fail to prevent Egyptians from smoking hash, but they also ended up introducing the substance to Western Europe, not unlike some of the American veterans returning from Vietnam. The French were no more successful at banning cannabis at home than abroad. In Paris, the open-minded writers and painters that made up the Romantic movement, which rejected the cold-blooded rationality of the Enlightenment, in favor of emotion and spirituality, tolerated and at times celebrated the drug that their government was trying to eradicate. They proudly referred to their intellectual circle as the Club de Hashishin, the Hash Eaters Club in English. Despite pressure from their own government, the Egyptian city of Cairo blossomed into one of the biggest hash markets in the world. Rivaled only by Istanbul and Turkey, Cairo's cannabis industry survived well into the late 1800s when a compounding list of prohibitions, penalties, and crackdowns caused its organizers to search for a new base of operation. Migrating along the coast of northern Africa, which they eventually settled in Morocco, where they remain to this day. 
Now there's a take on cannabis that you probably hadn't anticipated hearing on the Cannabis Podcast. What cannabis was like in ancient Egypt. Hmm. Hashish, anyone? And on that note, we come to the conclusion of another episode. I hope you enjoyed yourself. I am truly appreciative of the fact that you are here. And now, as I started last episode, let's finish with a joke. Did you hear about my neighbor? He just got arrested for growing weed. I guess my property line wasn't where I thought it was. That's it for episode 137 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the cannabis-infused studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Hi, it's Justin Benton, host of the Miracle Plant Podcast, where we discuss this miracle plant that goes by so many names and how it's helping people in so many extraordinary ways. So if you love this plant and you want to hear a story that tugs on those heartstrings and learn more about this plant, then head on over to the Miracle Plant Podcast. You'll be glad you did.